So I suppose I like buying value because I'm not betting necessarily on absolute growth in a linear fashion, which I think is difficult to get. But looking at maybe what a catalyst would be to drive that valuation gap from eight times to 12 to 14 times. And this is where actually it ends up crossing over with Rosemary a little bit, because if it's a quality company, the quality of the earnings, the quality of the cash flow starts to come through. And actually people then understand that it's worth 10, 12 times. So we're trying to find those hidden gems that might just be underneath the radar a little bit, sometimes because they might have made a couple of mistakes or management might not have communicated that well. Hello and welcome to Investing for the Long Term with Judith McKenzie and Rosemary Banyard. Judith is partner and head of Downing Fund Managers and Rosemary is an award-winning fund manager who manages the VT Downing Unique Opportunities Fund. This is the second episode of a six-part series where each episode builds on the next and becomes part of a mini-series of an investor's journey. During this episode, Judith and Rosemary share their investing styles and investing philosophies and how it has evolved over the many years they have been active fund managers. This was another great insight into how two seasoned fund managers think and how they view investing for the long term. If you enjoy listening to this episode and would like to hear more from Judith and Rosemary, please let us know by leaving a comment, subscribing and sharing with your networks. That way we can keep more great content coming your way. Now, just before we get started, please remember that all opinions and information are for educational purposes only and do not constitute investment advice. Investing carries a high level of risk and is not right for everyone. Always do your own research and seek financial advice from a regulated financial advisor in your country before making any financial decisions. With that being said, let's get started. Hello, Judith Rosemary. Thank you for joining us again on Investing for the Long Term, episode number two. Hi, Lee. Hi, Lee. So Judith, how would you categorize your investing style then your approach or methodology? Well, I think people do like to put you in a bucket and badge you, don't they? So I'm going to try not to do that. I would say I would be a focused investor. What does that mean? I suppose it means a few things. It means, first off, that I don't like to be investing in too many companies. I quite like to have the time uh, and privilege to be able to spend a lot of time with companies and, and reading. So you might find some investors have got portfolios of 100 to 150 stocks. I would typically be looking at between 25 and 40 stocks. And I'm also pretty slow, (laughs) which I think, again, is a bit of a privilege. So we have the time to do diligence and that helps when it's focused and you're slow. And to be slow, I think you need to be long term. So those are the the main attributes that I would say that or, or, or the way that we look at investing in our small companies. If you want to try and put us into a bucket, you'd probably say that we've got a value bias of some sort, but I'm sure we'll come on and talk about growth versus value uh, in a minute. So I would rather say that we're investing in good value businesses that have also got growth. So there we go, throw growth and value into the same sentence. Rosemary, how would you categorize your style or approach? Yes, yeah, it's interesting. I'd probably identify quite a lot with what Judith just said. And in particular, as the title of these series says, I would very much consider myself a long-term investor. And actually, my present fund explicitly states that I invest on a horizon of five plus years. So just so we understand what we're talking about here, in a market where a lot of people invest for a year or less. If I was to put myself in a recognised bucket, it'd probably be quality. Without going into big definitions, generally, that means I'm investing in profitable businesses, which earn a lot of money, make a, generate a lot of cash on the assets that they have at their disposal, whether that's people, factories, stock, etc. Whatever they have as a fixed or other assets, they're making a lot of profit from them. So I like to invest in very profitable businesses, and that's termed quality. I think there is some commonality between investment style and personality. And I hadn't thought much about this, but not long ago, I listened to a podcast by a former colleague of mine, Simon Adler at Schroeder's, who um, I think it's called the Value Investing Podcast that Schroeder's put out. So the interview with Simon, and he talks about the fact that he is basically a bargain hunter and that he's a bargain hunter in life as well as in the market. So he's going on looking for 
discounts or special offers. I reflected on this and thought, well, actually, I think that I identify with the quality angle in life. So, for example, my washing machine is a, a Mealy, which is the most expensive that you can buy because it's, it's supposed to last for 20 years and it's rock solid engineering. And so I do think there is a sort of a, a relationship between somebody like me who's prepared to pay up for quality in life and to some extent with care to pay for quality in, in the stock market. It's actually a really interesting insight that, isn't it? That you could actually look at the way you act and behave in your own life. You could use that as a basis to discover your own investing style or approach. Because it's really important, isn't it, that one finds a style that suits their own personality. Yeah, we get um, a lot of interns that come to us. They're pitching to come in and, and work with us. They'll see all the usual things about how they want to be an investor and the headlines. But then when you ask them what type of investing would suit them, they don't really have much of an idea at that stage. And I, I probably didn't either uh, when I was their age. But as you go through your investing career, it's so important, I think, when you're sitting in front of potential investors and investors that you can tell them how you invest and what to expect from your type of investment and how you'll perform at different points in the cycle. You can very much see that over the last 10 years or so, and especially the last two or three years. You're not always going to outperform. It just doesn't happen. But if you're performing in a way that you think you would do in certain markets, then people trust you and they'll put you into their portfolios accordingly. So you do need to know what kind of investor you are to gain people's trust. Yeah, people get more worried, yeah. worried yeah. if you start um, changing around. Yeah, definitely. When I first started as a fund manager, I was at a small firm called Gavette, and there were two guys who were running an investment trust, and they were my mentors. And this was sort of 30 years ago. And when I think back, because they were obviously early influences as the first practitioners that I worked with, that they were investing in businesses that were run by entrepreneurs, often with skin in the game. And they were investing in businesses which had, in their view, and, and I think proved correct at the time, a huge growth potential in their chosen markets. And they did very well. And the sort of names in those days that they were investing in were things like Weatherspoons, the pub company, where Tim Martin, has a, the founder and um, chief executive, has a big stake. Stagecoach, which in those days was building up its bus and rail franchises under Brian Souter. And Capita, which was at that stage building up a huge business in outsourcing government services. And all of those have had their challenges since, but for a long time, they did develop and grow very well in their chosen areas. And so I think that was an early influence on me in thinking about both skin in the game, that the people running the business actually have a decent stake in the business was important. And also this concept that if you can find a good area to invest in where there's lots of scope to take market share through being better or to tap into a long-term trend that could be fruitful as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose thinking about it, my early experience was very much in venture capital and private equity, which when I think about it now translates into the way that I probably look at things too. So I would probably be more inclined to look at where there might be an informational advantage or disadvantage in the market and also where you might be able to look at potential catalysts for value realization as well. And that's probably a little bit more akin to venture capital or private equity. The one thing I don't agree with private equity and venture capital is the gearing aspect is certainly like a balance sheet that's got net cash in it as opposed to layering something up with debt but some of the tools that a venture capitalist might have in their back pocket I think I've probably used throughout my investing career whether it be improving board governance and getting involved and in speaking to boards and trying to find that valuation point whether it be looking for an exit to a trade investor or whatever so I feel that I'm probably a little bit more engaged and hands-on than maybe some other on managers there you know, that comes back to that focused aspect as well rosary's mentioned some of her early influences who were yours or, or what was yours at that um, time i read a lot and probably got nicely obsessed with warren buffett and the great thing about buffett is that you can go back i can't actually rosen probably know this better than me but go back like 20 30 40 odd years maybe longer than that, actually, and read his notes. And that's brilliant because you can start seeing his evolution as an investor as well. He started getting into banking and insurance and whatever. If you were to look at one influence, I suppose, Buffett and Charlie Munger were the people that I read quite a lot during those days. And then just going back to the point of, yeah, I started off in venture capital. So therefore, I probably took a few influences from that side of things as well. 
But yeah, reading is the best thing you can do, I think. I think that helps identify the kind of language that you like. I don't know if that was true for you as well, Rosemary. Yes, absolutely. Second that on reading and also on the Buffett annual shareholder letters. I would very much encourage people, if they haven't found them, to do so. They're on the Berkshire Hathaway website, investor letters. And as Judith says, they go back 40 odd years. And although it's worth saying some of the letter gets into detail about the individual insurance company or a textile company, whatever it happens to be that he's owned, there are usually within their paragraphs, more general paragraphs on his philosophy and what he's learned, which are well worth well worth a read. So yes, I think I had a bit of a different influence slightly later when I went to Schroeder's and worked with Andy Graff. And I guess Andy brought to my thinking, well, a couple of things, really. One was thinking about the potential for turnarounds or businesses that had been oversold, but were perfectly good and how to think about that, how to potentially make even more money by buying something when it was on its sort of downers, as it were, but also reinforcing the fact that he's very much a believer in the, the individual running the business and trying to evaluate whether they were just a, a hired hand or actually somebody with a rather more get up and go and or vision about them. So I, I think throughout life, the message here is that you, you're picking up different angles from different people and there's always something to learn. And I think the style and methods that we use are always being m- modified and improved. You're never done. Yeah, that's true. That's true. When I was thinking about this and maybe what some of the influences are now, and yeah, sure, we can talk about some books that we're reading or whatever, but I think I've been really lucky because I'm growing a fund management business. And when we started off doing that a few years ago, I wanted to bring on people that who I respected and actually who I could learn from. So in my own strange way, I've probably managed to get a flock of people around about or, or together where we can all learn from slightly different strategies. Even though Rosemary's investing in smaller companies and we've got a bit of overlap when it comes to market cap ranges, Rosemary's style is different to mine and mine's different to Josh, who also invests in smaller companies and income companies. And again, quite different to Nick. So it's great to have a flock of people that I suppose have handpicked to a certain extent and where we can share notes and talk about different investment styles and actually talk about different investing and investments. Judith, you mentioned you perhaps favour value over growth or value with a slice of growth. So could you share a little bit about that then? <laughs> <laughs> trying to get the best of both worlds, basically, I think. Yeah. Try and break it down and simplify it a little bit, which is not necessarily easy to do, but Value might be seen as buying a stock or a position that is sitting on a lower rating to that of its peers. And and this is flawed in its own way as well. But what does that really mean? Maybe the the most simple way of looking at it is a a price to earnings ratio. And that very simply is, say a a stock price is £24. I'm going to have to do maths quickly here because I'm never good at it. And the earnings for that share might be £3. The P-E ratio is 24, which is the stock price divided by the earnings per share in that year. So that's 24 divided by three, which last time I looked was eight times. And then you, then you might say, okay, what's another company trading at in this space? And they might be on 10 times. So you might then assume that if this company gets rated like that other peer, then it would go to 10 times. So there'd be an increase in its rating. So that's roughly where value orientated investor would, would be looking. They'd be looking to be investing at a rating that's lower than the sector and maybe lower than the small cap market. It also means that, although I think there's flaws to it, it means when something's on, say, 40 times earnings, you're really looking for 40 times its annual earnings to get to justifying the price that you're paying. So you really are looking for good growth. They're looking for something that might be missed in forecasts to get you to that price or that justification quicker. So I suppose I like buying value because I'm not betting necessarily on absolute growth in a linear fashion, which I think is difficult to get. But but looking at maybe what a catalyst would be to drive that valuation gap from eight times to 12 to 14 times. And this is where actually it ends up crossing over with Rosemary a little bit, because if it's a quality company, the quality of the earnings, the quality of the cash flow starts to come through. And actually people then understand that it's worth 10, 12 times. 
So we're trying to find those hidden gems that might just be underneath the radar a little bit, sometimes because they might have made a couple of mistakes or management might not have communicated that well. And if we can try and work with those companies to get them to communicate better, maybe get a better board round about them and get themselves understood, if the quality of the underlying earnings is there, then actually it tends to come through in the end. And what I like about investing at the the low end of the market, when market caps are, say, under 150, 200 300 million market caps, the pricing anomalies are higher because actually there's 0.8 of an analyst covering the companies that we tend to have in our universe. So there's our quite uh, imperfection when it comes to information. So if we're diligent, then we can actually do our work and find these companies and, and then hopefully get them to a rating that is much more deserved. Yeah, Judith explained earnings. So, you know, how many years of this year's profit you're paying for when you buy something? And other people will use other yardsticks to measure value. One, which is easy to understand, is the dividend yield. So if a company is paying a dividend, what what are you getting each year compared with the amount you've invested in the business? It's your um, running return, as it were, a bit, a bit like interest in the bank. So you might be at the moment, you might be getting 3% or 4% from a lot of companies uh, in terms of their annual amount they pay you compared with what you've paid for the shares. And there's a a third metric that people use, which is they compare the value of the business to the book value. That is, if you look at the last accounts and you look at how the accountants have valued the assets less the liabilities of the business, which is itself slightly flawed because it often has historic numbers in there for certain things. For example, it might have the value of the factories when you bought them, which could be a long while ago. And it also won't value other things like intellectual property necessarily or the skills of your people. So that's difficult, actually, book value, but people do use it. I personally have found one metric useful in this list. When a company's had profit warning, cyclical downturn, gone through a bad patch, not necessarily through any fault of their own, some external factor, and the shares have gone down a lot. Looking at the value of the business compared with its annual revenues can be helpful because revenues don't fluctuate that much. Profits can fluctuate a lot, but your revenues in a bad year, they might be down 10% or maybe a bit more, but the volatility in that line tends to be less. And so often that can be an attractive value. But one thing that that Buffett has said is that people feel they must choose between value and growth and that they're often thought to be in opposition. And I I, I don't think either of us think that. How much, at what rate a business is growing is interesting. Personally, I get a bit concerned if the business isn't growing. There are people who are happy to invest in, in businesses which are not growing. But generally speaking, I'd prefer a business to be growing. It doesn't have to be growing very fast. In fact, steady is good. Predictable can be very good. But the rate of growth is an important factor in the sustainable longer term rate of growth is a very important factor in the attractiveness or otherwise of a business. But for me, the most important thing is not either of those. It's actually look at uh, the businesses, as I said, and what return they're obtaining on the capital that's invested. And you can tell whether a business has got attributes that keep the competition out by looking at that measure. It it is also actually variable between industries and variable between whether you've got a a business which has lots of fixed assets, factories, manufacturing, might be heavy industry, or whether it's actually got lots of assets which are tied up with people in it and expertise, in which case they won't feature, as I've said, in the accounts as such as as an asset or a liability, arguably both. But um, (laughs) that is going to affect the returns that a company can make. It's quite important to to understand that when when you're talking about quality, that that is what I fundamentally mean. I agree. I like free cash flow because if it companies generating free cash, then it's got an option. It tends to have cash in the balance sheet, but it's got the option of either returning capital to investors, which we're happy with through dividends or special dividends or buybacks, or probably what I like more is where they've got a strong cash flow and a good return on invested capital. They then invest that pound back into the business and the return on invested capital is 20p in the pound every year. Then you're getting that compounding effect of that pound going to pound twenty, then compounding further on over the years as well. So I think I, I quite like a combination of a strong free cash flow true cash flow, which the great thing about cash flow is the accountants can't get their fingers around it too much. Free cash is free cash, or it should be. So it's quite a good metric for judging profitability of a company. And then that 
compound effect of return on invested capital. One thing we haven't talked about yet, though, is management, which I think they're the key to everything, really, in the end. And I was going to ask Rosemary, how much do you value a site visit to be able to evaluate the things like the assets that are sitting there and the people and whatever? Or are you in the camp that says you you look at the facts and the report accounts and nothing else? Or is it something in between? Yeah, it's a very interesting debate, isn't it? So there are people who say they wouldn't ever visit a company because it will bias them and they need to just be clear thinking. And then there are others who say, oh, must visit, must meet the management always before investing. I lean slightly to the latter. So I do want to always meet the management because you can get a sense, not of initially of whether they're particularly good management, but of their motivations through talking to them, what motivates them. And I think that's quite important. Are they there just to uh, make a quick buck for themselves with a, an incentive scheme and then three years and they're off? Or are they someone who understands the industry well and is committed for the long term? Those are, for me, key questions. On site visits, I do like to kick the tyres where it's relevant. I think sometimes it helps you to understand the business better, how they make money, who the competition are, to also to talk to middle management, who you, we never normally see. The people that come around the city are the usually the chief exec and the finance director, and you, you very rarely meet the other people. So trying to get some sense of the middle management's key, key, you can learn something. So a long time ago, I went to visit a company in, in the West Midlands that was making the chassis for four by fours. And it was a small listed business. And it happened that my visit was scheduled for first thing on a Monday morning. It was just me. And I stayed the night before with my brother who lives locally. The visit was scheduled for 9am and I happened to be early. So I sat in my car in the car park for 20 minutes and the management team rocked up at five to nine. And that was one black cross. And sorry if this upsets anyone, but they had personalised number plates as well, I noticed. <laughs> and I don't, I, w- I wouldn't have noticed either of those things if I hadn't been scheduled for a first thing on a Monday morning. And I must tell you, it put me off completely. <laughs> I think that's quite good. I think I've got a few stories like that as well. <laughs> this sounds a bit dodgy, but actually hanging around the, the ladies' loose or whatever on a site visit, and that's... Don't take that the wrong way, but where you, you get to maybe meet people that you wouldn't necessarily see that are going to get ruled out can tell you an awful lot about the culture of a company. And I've had a, quite a few conversations, washing our hands or whatever, and just talking to somebody that might be the cleaner even, where actually I think one person said, yeah, it's quite strange to see the management team and they don't often come in. They'll maybe just be here one, one day a week. But okay, we like management teams that live above the shop, not ones that are doing other things and maybe sitting at home and not engaged with their business. So I think they can be quite telling. But I I always said that we wouldn't invest in companies unless they'd been on site. And again, that's part of that focused approach that we've got. We've got the time to be able to do that. And then, of course, COVID hit. And then we were making investments when we hadn't been on site. And sometimes we hadn't actually met the management team in the flesh. And our performance was pretty good. And nothing faltered through that period. So I've probably gone from being absolutely adamant that you've got to kick the tires and meet the management and get to understand. Obviously, you need to understand the motivations. But I think now we do it in a slightly slightly more focused way. I suppose that also is indicative of the size of the companies that you're investing in, because would you still consider, say, let's go into see a FTSE 100 company or anything like that? It's probably not in the same realms of possibilities as going to, say, see a, a chassis maker in the Midlands, is it? Yeah, and that's probably why I quite like investing in small companies, actually, because you can, you, do that. The, the, you can do it, yeah. And actually, when you do make the effort and phone up a company that's, say, 50, 100 million market cap, very often they feel a bit unloved. And, and when you pitch up for the day and you show interest in their business, they are, they're really engaged. And that, to me, is a, a great thing to see because that probably gives me a bit of an advantage over another fund manager. I certainly have more information, no doubt. And sometimes they've not even been visited by their analyst. So you couldn't do that if it's a FTSE company. I've noticed when a company kind of moves from the upper end of the mid-250 into the FTSE 100, often they, not always, but often the style of engagement with shareholders changes. They may end up appointing a, what I would term a bulge bracket stockbroker to act for them, one of the sort of houses that does a lot in the States. If they haven't already, they appoint an investor relations team who field all the questions and something is lost in all that for sure compared with 
the dealings with small and even medium sized businesses. Presuming here that you focus primarily on UK markets against global markets, why is that? Why do you only focus on UK <laughs> companies? I, I think it's a bit of a misnomer, isn't it? So looking at our portfolio at the moment, around about 55% of the earnings come from overseas. So actually, we've got uh, global companies in the UK and we can go out and kick the tires on them and meet the management team and whatever. And I think one of the reasons that this perception that the UK is sort of undervalued and maybe not a great place to invest is because it's so focused on UK earnings. I think it's a complete misnomer. I think that might be true in some of the FTSE stocks, but not certainly in the companies that we're looking at. They, these companies are international earners. And that's part of the challenge as well, part of the fun, because you might be investing in a widget manufacturer in Newcastle, but they'll be selling into a a European market, German market maybe, or also the US. And you've got to understand what those dynamics are. So it's not just about selling down the road. It's, it really is trying to understand the dynamics of and the interesting dynamics of different markets. So I think we do invest in global companies. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think my uh, fund is 60% overseas. People just don't realise how international a lot of these businesses are. So even a, a small UK company, they, they might well start off just selling in their home market. But if they've got a product that's globally relevant, they will then start to eventually start exporting. And of course, it's a much bigger market for them. So I'm thinking a company that I've invested in for a long time called um, Tristel, which makes disinfectant for outpatient equipment. And they started off just selling to the NHS. That was their first um, port of call. But they then started to get approvals, which they need in different countries, most recently in the US. And now something like two thirds of their revenues are exports. It's a classic how, how you'd want a business to develop. What about investing in IPO? Is that something that either of you do? Yeah, I think I've done one in... 25, 30 years. That's and I don't think I'll do it again. <laughs> That's a no. Yeah. 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 It's an irony of our world, actually, that we want lots of businesses to list. We have seen the opposite <laughs> happening. We, we, yes, we've seen a lot of businesses disappearing off the UK market and the AIM market, which is a source of concern and something we'd like to see very much see reversed. But we are reluctant to invest in most businesses when they first arrive on the market. Uh, I'm the same. So why? Firstly, at the point that they come to the market, they've had to publish a, a very full prospectus. And th these things are, are well worth reading. Uh, years, even years after a company's on the market, it's worth going back to mm. read the prospectus because it will tell you all about the competition, about the history of why their margins have done what they've done, lots and lots of information. So everybody knows absolutely everything all the same. There's certainly no information advantage at, uh, at IPO. Uh, in, initial public offering. But also, m most of the businesses that come are coming out of private equity. And our regrettable experience is that many of them are then brought to the market at the top of a particular cycle and or having had very restricted investment because private equity have been very focused on paying down debt. And so in general, wanting to generate cash, they only do essential investment. And then you find businesses coming to the market who then need to start investing again for catch up. So on the whole, when I invest, I prefer to invest when companies come to the market, when they've come from private individuals, say, who've set up a company and decided that they want now to come to the market. It might mean that the founders are going to exit over time, but they will be responsible about that because it's their baby. And they are the ones which I'm happier to invest in. Yeah, I think that's very sensible, Rosemary. It's a great way of explaining it. I think for me as well, when our company's coming to market, yes, you've got the prospectus, but you've probably got quite a short window to do your diligence. And you might have a 45-minute call with or meeting with a management team that are all dressed up, ready to go to the party. So exceptionally slick. And it's quite difficult to get any kind of inf informational advantage at that point. And then you've got basically the price being set by people bidding against fund managers almost bidding against each other. So it's just not the right way to, to make investments. It's, it's too quick and you don't really feel as though you're getting an informational advantage. I'd much rather wait. We've had some really good companies that we've met at IPO but not invested where they've come and they have probably over-egged a valuation on the basis of a forecast that might be a little bit 
pumped up and then they profit worn and they come back about I think on average they come back the last 10 years come back about 30-40% on that profit warning after an IPO then it gets interesting because you've had the chance to see the company two or three times you've got to get the prospectus and you've, or you've got the prospectus that's relatively recent and you've probably got a management team that's going to be far more prudent uh, the next time when they put out forecasts and if they're a good quality business in the first instance then it's probably quite a good entry point Companies also need to get used to being on the stock market. If they've never Mm. been listed, managements need to learn how to handle that. And sometimes they need to learn, as Judith said, the hard way that the best way to be is always making sure that estimates out there in the market for next year are conservatively struck year after year. And if you can get into that position that's the best place to be. You don't, you, you can try and avoid disappointing people, which is brutally rewarded with uh, share price cuts. Yeah. One of the things I've heard you mention a couple of times is dividends. How important are dividends to you guys? Do they play an important role in your approach? I mean, for me, it's, I'm not fixated by them at all. And going back to that return on invested capital point, if they're getting a good return on investing in their own business, then I'd much rather they plowed the money back into the business. But sometimes it really is ex- excess capital and it's probably because they've got a good cash flow yield. So it's, I think it's a nice signal and it's it's nice to be paid to wait as well. In the meantime, as you're holding a share, if you're a long-term shareholder. But I think certainly when I'm looking at a company, I want to make sure that they're not just paying a dividend because they want to be on the shareholder list of um, people who buy income funds and actually the dividend is proportionate and they don't have a better use of cash elsewhere. So I don't just see a dividend and think it's a positive. I probably put quite a lot of scrutiny on it. Yes, I'd agree. I too don't prioritise dividend income. And I I totally agree that if a business is earning good returns and has found a, a, a market that it can profitably develop, then I'd rather that they invested more money in developing that failing that if the share price is low and below what the business is really worth and perhaps won't discuss what that means now but just take that face value if the business is valued by the stock market below its true value i'd rather that they actually the company used spare cash to buy shares in and cancel them than pay out the money because i as a long term holder will be better off if they do that, actually. But we understand that there are people who want a particular level of income on their investments and are therefore looking for companies which offer them a particular level of yield. It's it's relevant to a lot of people. And there are people who, either for administrative reasons or tax reasons, would rather have a regular stream of income than sell shares or sell income fund shares to meet their ongoing requirements. So we come to the end of this podcast, episode number two. What makes a good investor then? What attributes make a good investor? Do women make better investors than men? <laughs> Is that an attribute? Or... <laughs> <laughs> Is that a question that I probably should answer? Ask? You're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose let's like, go back to the facts. The, the facts are that I think Fidelity, Warwick Business School and various other folk have done studies on this. And apparently we are best <laughs> investors. Right. So the stats we'll are there. there. I think it's point. <laughs> yeah, just leave it there. I, and I, look, what makes a good investor, I think it, it's not gender necessarily. I think a lot of it to do is, this is my view, I think being patient and not having an ego is important. And hopefully that's something that both of us have got. <laughs> Or not got. Not got, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, I think there's an obsessiveness about us as a breed. <laughs> I, I, or perhaps if I say that I observe it, you can observe, we've talked about Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, both in their 90s and still absolutely enthused, interested by this career. And I, I think this obsessiveness about relating your everyday experiences to what you could invest in profitably is a feature. I think, as Judith said, patience and I think discipline rather than being swayed by something you read in a newspaper or something that in our world a broker rings up and says, this one looks interesting, rather than being swayed by that or being swayed by momentum, which so many people are. If a share price has gone up, it must be a successful idea. 
And if a share price has gone down, there must be something really, really wrong about this. Ignoring all the noise and having the discipline to stick with your methods is, I think, important. It's being strong minded. I think that's a key attribute. Yeah, 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 that's a good point, Rosemary. I think also you, I've, I mean, to me, it doesn't really feel like a job. I shouldn't say this. If I didn't get paid for it, I'd still be doing it anyway. So you've got to have that kind of passion, desire to learn more, read, and feel really happy about taking 10 years of sets of reports and accounts and going into a room and literally locking yourself away and going through it. So there's there's something quite forensic about the job that we do. You wouldn't do it necessarily if you um, didn't really believe in and have conviction in what you were doing. Would it be fair to say that you are some of the lucky ones who have found something that you do, even if you didn't get paid for it? Yeah, yes, we don't uh, say that too often to Downing, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll keep that quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah, definitely. Very lucky. What would you say to somebody who's listening about how they could go about finding their own style, their own approach? What would you say to them? How can they get started? I think it goes back to reading, doesn't it? The good thing about fund managers is that they publish fact sheets and report accounts and there's a good there's a good level of detail and I would probably just start reading about what other fund managers do and where you feel most comfortable just thinking about it actually when interns come in very often once they leave they ask exactly this question and we've got a bit of a a downing reading list and that's come from like Rosemary, Simon and the other fund managers so it's something that I'm more than happy to be able to share if people are prepared to go through it and that's actually got it's not just a, a value investing tilt or growth it's got it's right across the different spectrums and everything from movies right the way through to podcasts and books as well so I'm more than happy to share that. I wouldn't mind seeing it. You actually contributed to it Rosemary as well <laughs> but I'll send, I'll send it to you. <laughs> I was unaware of it. <laughs> Is, you sent me an email and I um, went off, read some of them and I added them, added all of them to the list, actually. Yeah, I'll ping it across and you can put it, I'm, I'm happy for you to put it wherever, actually. And that's a really good gift, that. Thank you, Judith. So what I'll do then is I'll put a downloadable link in the show notes just below. So if you're listening or watching, if you just scroll down to the bottom of the show notes where it says resources, there you'll see a link that will say investors reading and watch list. If you just click on that, it should just download for you. If you are struggling and it won't download for some reason, please write me an email, info at fundyourretirement.com and I'll make sure I get that across to you. As we come to the end of the podcast, we'll finish off with one book recommendation to read. So Judith, what have you brought for us today? So I, last time I think I mentioned that I was reading or I had read James Ashton's book, The Everything Blueprint, which was about the the rise of ARM, the, the chip manufacturer, the chips that are in every device pretty much that you've ever owned. And it actually reminded me of a book called The Big Blue, and this goes back to 1986, so it's not exactly topical. But it was about the rise of IBM, basically the start of desktop computing back in the day. And IBM, previous to going more into the mainstream, was providing computer massive supercomputers for governments and whatever. So they did a real tilt into this kind of more consumer-led uh, product. And it, it was quite, it's interesting in terms of being able to see how it, they managed to tilt quite so quickly from something that would be a massive computer into literally something on your desk. So that that was interesting. And, and also how they managed to gain global dominance, but also some of the practices that were going on at the time when it came to competition, worth reading about. And also how governments were very quickly tried to jump on the, the superpower that it was becoming and how power corrupts to a certain extent. There's quite bad practices going on at that time. It was a bit of an arms race, really. So I found that one quite interesting. It's a little bit dated because it was written in 1986, but I think some of the messages are still quite relevant. If I may, I, I would like to go for a podcast. There's a guy called Howard Marks, M-A-R-K-S, who is the founder and head of a, an American business called Oak Tree Capital. And he publishes a podcast It comes out, I don't know, once every two to four weeks. And it's called The Memo. And he is a distressed debt, a high yield debt investor. So he's not like us investing in the shares of companies. He's investing in the debt that companies have taken on and the bonds that they've issued, which people can buy. But uh, he won't give you tips on what companies to buy. It's not that kind of a podcast. But he is quite an interesting commentator on macro events, macroeconomics, bond markets, and just some of the ways to think about the fundamentals of investing. He's very clear and very logical, quite helpful. 
Perfect. I'm Common sure sense. our audience will be very appreciative of that and hopefully appreciative of this uh, episode. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your time again. That was excellent. Not at all. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. In our next episode of Investing for the Long Term, Judith and Rosemary will focus on how they analyze individual stocks, what skill sets are required, things to avoid, red flags, meetings with management, and much, much more. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a comment. The more feedback we get, the more value we can offer. And if you'd like to learn more about Rosemary, Judith, and Downing, then please visit www.downingfundmanagers.co.uk. All the links are in the show notes just below. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to speaking to you in our next episode. Hope you have a great day, and bye for now.